I think it was a very expensive, ignorance is costly. You might say, oh, I did not know, and I this and that, that is why I did this. But it does not take away the consequences of those decisions. Right. So I faced a lot of consequences as a result of the decisions that I made. Welcome to the show. I am your host, Anya Fombad, and I spark the heart conversations that challenge questionable cultural and societal norms that threaten the well-being of the African community. And I also share stories about growing up as Africans in Africa and in the diaspora. I strongly believe that normalizing open discussions and sharing experiences, whether good or bad, will not only make you find your voice, but will broaden your sense of purpose and empower others to do the same. So if you have ever tried challenging certain African cultural and societal doctrines, or if you have ever felt like it is about time that we confronted these issues in our African community and do better as a people, or even if you have always been interested in learning about the experiences of other Africans growing up in Africa and the diaspora, then you are in the right place. Welcome to Living African. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Living African. This episode is going to be a continuation of the previous two episodes, um, which had shed light on uh, an African man's perspective on domestic abuse and basically just abuse because it was not only abu- domestic abuse, um, it was emotional, physical, mental abuse, you name it. So this episode will be um, the continuation of where we left off um, and we will highlight the aspect of divorce from an African man's perspective, especially in the diaspora. Um, but before that, I just wanted to make this clear Um, The purpose of this podcast is not to encourage divorce, especially in situations that can be mended. So the goal is to challenge the stigma of divorce using lessons from real life stories and to encourage anyone who is facing an unrepairable marriage not to feel trapped in the fear of judgment and to know that there is a life after divorce. So um, I have here with me. Olu Femi, and I would call him Femi for short. That actually is not his real name, but he chose to go anonymous because children are involved and which is rightfully understandable. So um, I just want to welcome you back um, to the show or to the episode, Femi. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you. So um, um, it was such a great discussion, you know, that we had with um, the abuse. And I am so looking forward to the divorce aspect of it. So for those who probably will start watching this episode from episode 22, <laughs> instead <laughs> of starting from the from scratch, um, I just wanted us to do a brief refresher about um, what led to this point of divorce. So um, just very, very brief on, you know, why you decided to file for divorce and what was the straw that broke the horse's back. Yes, sure. Thank you so much. So I, I, it was a build up, not something that just happened within a month from the long distance courtship relationship period. You know, things, you know, it was like one stack after another, different forms of abuse and passive aggressive behaviors. And they just stacked up in a very, in a very passive manner. And over time, they became the foundation of the relationship, I should say. But, so, but the final straw that broke the camel's back was when my ex-spouse put her hands on me in a very violent way. And even with that, my first thought was not divorce, but I was, I just knew that I, I could not live with such a person again because yeah. I feared for my life. Right, right. So um, thank you for that brief refresher. So um, now, before even making that final decision to divorce, did you feel any kind of pressure from the outside, let's say from the community or from family, friends, church, do you feel any pressure from them to stay in the marriage? Or did you even feel any internal pressure? Because sometimes we tend to pressure ourselves as well. So I, I think I had gone beyond my own personal breaking point. And all along, there was pressure before the marriage, during the marriage, and after the marriage. And um, so there was a point when I saw what I saw, you know, I decided that, you know, the mar- we would not get married. But I, I take responsibility for that. I succumbed to the external pressure. 
And mm. then when whatever I saw, you know, um, still featured in the in the marital relationship, in the marriage, you know, I, you know, I put up with it for a couple of years. And when it got to the point where, you know, I was like, I don't want to be, <laughs> be taken out of my own house in the stretcher, especially because there were nights that I actually spent in the car, in yeah. my car, just in fear of my, of, you know, of my life. People did not know that. Mm. So, yeah, so there was pressure all along. And um, when I finally made the decision, you know, that, you know, I don't think I can be in this. I'm just saying I made the decision, you know, one of us had to step forward because the action of my ex-spouse was really indicative that she wasn't in it. You know, she was yeah. interested in extra other things. So, yeah, so, yeah, there, were pr- there was pressure all along from my close community um from i'm this i'm not talking about my um my um my my blood relationships but from yeah. my close community to my church to my environment to my friends yes there was there was a lot of pressure so can you give like certain kind of examples of the pressure or was it just basically just a judgmental aspect of everything um I think they heard what I was saying, but they were not listening to me. The, all they wanted to tell me was they do not think I have done enough, you mm. know, which is which is what I found really funny. They, they treated my ex, my then spouse, they treated my ex-wife, my then wife as if she was she was a child who didn't know left from right. And then, like I was the adult, you know, who need to help her through, um, through her to help her through the through the journey. Mm-hmm. Which, if you think about it, in a way, they they themselves were enablers in, because she she realized that she succeeded in you know in wooing them, in, in you know in that in that in that sense of the word. So I mean, it it was a feeling of I don't know, put it in so many different ways. There was anxiety, there was yeah. shame, there was all of those things. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. Well, thank you very much. I mean, thankfully, you still went ahead to 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 pursue the divorce, which was, I mean, obviously turned out to be for your best interest and for that of your children. So mm-hmm. um, just walk us through the divorce process, um, especially for those in America or, you know, I, I would I would have loved to say whatever state you're in. But, you know, this is for anonymity's sake. I can't say that. But yeah. I I. I I would love to really know about the divorce process and how that impacted you emotionally, mentally, um, and also legally and financially. Yeah. So thank you so much. Each of those things is like, you know, like really heavy. And before I say anything, let me just preface it by say that, you know, divorce is not necessarily like a win for <laughs> A, a win a win lose situation yeah. you know it's there's pain on both sides because yeah. you know because it's 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 like it's like rushing someone to an emergency room there's a tearing apart there's a, there's a breaking okay a husband and wife can divorce but how you you cannot divorce them from their children if they have children so yeah. there's there's always some sort of connection there so but i i haven't said that the process wasn't easy the decision wasn't easy. It was very, it was some, I've come across people whose situations were completely different from mine. And I get that. So I'm just sharing my story. Mm -hmm. The whole process from start to finish was very adversarial. It was just full of negativity. And when those things happen, the attorneys benefit Mm. because the, the more antagonistic the adults are, you know, who are, who are who are in the whole thing the more yeah. you know things can really drag but yeah. in 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 my state legally um the pa- both parties must the, the couple must have been separated for at least 12 months mm. and and with no with no indication of and and a separation date must have been established in my case it was the um, what do you call it the protective order yeah. was an established date as the start of the separation and making sure that there's there's no form of intimacy, you, you know what I mean by yeah, that. Yeah. And then before they can start with the process, you you cannot rush it. But however, given the situation that I was in, you know, you could still uh, you could in the course of the separation, you could still apply for a limited divorce. It's not absolute, yeah. and the absolute divorce happens later. So if the divorce is uncontested by both parties, then okay, it can take. In my state, it, this so again, separation is one year. The whole divorce process itself could possibly take another about another one year. Mm. 
Hmm. Because the divorce process includes the whole custody things, then it also includes the divorce hearing and things like that. Yeah. So the more the more discoveries they are asking for, the more um, um, proof of this or that they're asking for, the more claims against each other. What is the truth of the lies that your party is bringing? The longer the process the process gets, the, the court is in no rush. They just they give you a date. Right. <laughs> it can give you it like months ahead of time and then you just have to wait it out and things like that. So, it, I mean, it was a whole, you know, it was a whole process. So we were separated legally for at least a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, and then they, they, we filed, I, I filed for divorce and my ex-spouse to filed mm-hmm. for, yes, my ex-spouse to file for, for divorce. Um, it, it, I mean, it, it's just like, if I say to you, you know, I have this charge against you and you to say to me, you to have this charge against me, take note, the judges, the attorneys, they, they, they really don't have any personal vested interest in the whole process. They don't know you guys. You know your stories more than them. You know your yeah. children more than them. So the more you hand your life to the legal system, you know, the, the more, it, the, because after all of that is said and done, one year of separation and one year of going through the divorce process sounds like a long time. Maybe that's about a year and a half, two years. Mm-hmm. But imagine the age of the children, if they are less than four, less than five, yeah. less than six. You see how the next couple of years until they become adults for you to see deal with stuff together. Yes. And you think the court will be there every day. No, you guys are not kids. So you have to handle your mess. You have to handle your business after that. Whether it was one party who created it or both parties, it doesn't matter at that point. Both of you are in it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Wow. So um, let's start with the emotional aspect of it. How was it for you emotionally? Was it something that you're looking forward to just getting that final relief or was it like emotionally traumatizing for you? It was emotionally traumatizing because it, it wasn't, it wasn't like I developed enmity against my ex-spouse or I developed hatred towards her. Mm-hmm. But the whole process was just been, I, take note, I had to guard, not that I did not struggle with those things, I did, but I had to really guard my heart because I know if I develop any of those things, it's going to be in my own heart. Yeah. So, yeah, so emotionally, I was, <laughs> externally, I was very composed. I think I still had enough sleep. I, I don't lose sleep when I'm stressed out. I mean, I could, mm. but what I'm trying to say is that God really helped me through the process. Um, I did mention about going through a 13-week divorce care process just to help me keep my mind intact. So those are some of the things that helped me to not get crazy. But I'm telling you, um, between I was just going through my notes of you know of the course I went through, and I saw where one of the days I rated my emotions as very bad. I'm, I'm not talking about actions. No, I'm just, I'm talking about what is going inside of you that you yeah. cannot explain. It does yeah. not mean loss of control, but I'm, I'm talking anxiety, sadness, you know, you, you rage, loneliness, betrayal, helplessness, yeah. the feeling of rejection, distrust. How could this happen to me? Yeah. You're just trying to figure things out. And then there's just one while you're trying to figure it figure it out, the divorce process is going on. Before you know it, you receive a letter from the other party, maybe through from the attorney, and it's 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 one hundred points or ten points, and one is the truth, and the other nine are lies. How oh do you goodness. prove? How do you prove the burden of proof is on you now? I, I yeah. didn't do it. You become defensive for something that you believe that you are ignorant in, and and the whole thing just it just goes on. <laughs> so um, emotionally, it was it was not easy. Um, it's not a journey it, it, by all means, like you mentioned at the beginning, if people can sort out their mess, even if it is adultery, even if it is domestic violence, if yeah. they can, then that is very good for them because the process is not a, you know, it's not a funny one. Yeah. You, you could go down and it takes you years to come back yeah. to yourself in yeah. one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Well, I'm so sorry that you, you know, you went through that, you know, but um, I hope that regardless of whatever happened, you did not regret your decision because um, at the end of the day, your happiness matters the most. And um, you're yeah. obviously in a position where you had no other choice, but, you know, to do what you did. So, yeah. um, so what about um, the financial aspect of it? <laughs> um, divorce. I, I, I don't know why I had this quote, but I'll just borrow it from there. Mm-hmm. It says that if you think ignorance 
if you think knowledge is expensive, try ignorance. Right. If if you think um, counseling or therapy, uh, seeing a therapist is expensive, then try um, divorce. The process was expensive, very expensive. Mm -hmm. In some, especially when it is being contested. Sometimes the divorce is not being contested, but some facts are being contested. It just tracks the thing. The more it tracks, the more the lawyers have their money. Yeah. And what what they what they don't realize by they I, re, I mean the couple going through the divorce. What they don't realize is that after all of that is said and done, it is their own hard work. Mm. It is possibly money that would have gone to their children's um, um, tuition or their personal investments that they are giving out to the attorneys and and things like that. Mm. So it it, it affects financially. We there was a. There was a joint account we had that went down to zero. I don't want to get into the details of it because yeah. that's just another story. Yeah, but there was a joint account that went down to zero. And you look back in retrospect and you ask yourself, because all of that money in that joint account was <laughs> was from my was from my job. Mm-hmm. I mean, all of it, 100%. And then you look back and you ask yourself, so all this while that I worked this money, was it for it just to be drained yeah. like this? So, so it, 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 there is its own. Um, it has its own grieving process that you go through, and you 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 just see an attorney maybe charging you a certain um, ridiculous amount of money per hour. Mm. Um, what, I mean, they didn't ask you to get divorced. You came and saw them. So, hello, that's the process. So, it it, it is it is that it was very expensive um, financially. And stuff like that, especially because you see, have to go through um, your your regular life, and especially when one party becomes very, um, very crafty. Yeah. <laughs> when one party becomes very crafty and then takes um, a colossal sum of money and then just touches it somewhere, you and you cannot prove that, or yeah. they can tell you anything that happened with it, and then so you trying to be truthful in the process, you just. Let the truth be that that is your value system, not because you think that because you are truthful, then you will win. You will win um, as a result of your of your being truthful. The, yeah. the divorce process is ter- it's it's terrible when it is being contested. When one person wants to see the other one suffer, yeah. when it becomes gets a place of rage yeah. more yeah. than just going through the process. Yeah, and it's kind of an ironic because the person who had the most rage was the abusive one. You know, yeah. so it's um. It's it's very ironic right there. So I know, I mean, of course, um, the divorce process was very complex, but I would imagine it's it was even way more complicated and difficult with kids involved. So how did yeah. you guys maneuver all of that with the kids involved? Yeah, um, to be honest, I think... I know that the, the listeners might be, oh, wait, you're the one telling your side of the story. Yes, I am, and I'm going to just state the facts. I think I was a more stable party based on my job, based on, you know, my personal composure and stuff like that. Yeah. So what that meant was that the bulk of the work for the kids, you know, was on me. And the attorneys quickly realized that, not realized that they will go and fight for me in court, unfortunately, but they repeatedly told me that they said from everything that they, they see, they, they, I mean, they cannot really establish that. But let me be prepared in the long, in the short haul and in the long haul, you know, to take a lot of responsibilities that my then to be ex spouse was probably just going to drop off along the way. Of course, I knew that before they said it. Okay. So, yeah, so it, it's challenging. Think about it. You have to pick up your kids by three, maybe by 3 p.m., 3.10 p.m., whatever time they close from school. Mm-hmm. And then maybe that coincides with um, coincide with a time that you have to be in court. So you you, you start experiences, experiencing loss of time. Mm-hmm. Take note, there's already, we're already separated. They're asking you this bunch of documents. Even if you are 100% ignorant, I mean, um, innocent, sorry, yeah. you still have to produce this bunch of documents. And I remember this night, it took me, I repeat this, I'm not speaking with, my senses are intact, I know exactly what I am saying. It took me 12 midnight to 12 midnight to 12 midday, just printing documents and putting things one after another. Ask me, that, yes, so ask me that when the kids wake up in the morning, what time do I spend with them, you know, and what time do I get to produce all of those things? And then you, so, so, and sometimes producing those documents may it just be because the other party has accused you of something. It doesn't have to be right. They yeah. are very aware that they, they, um, the judge, the, the, the lawyers can get really crafty. 
if they want to be. And they are, they are aware that the judge does not know you guys personally. So whatever sounds convincing to the judge and whatever his intuition is telling him, whether he's right, he or she is right or not, you know, they will, they will go by that. So people are aware of that. So they mm-hmm. come up with all sorts of things. So it took a lot of precious time away, you know, yeah. um, you know, from the children. It's not called, it's not every week they give you time, but just the process in between. Someday you just want to have a very nice rest. You, you receive an email that your yeah, attorney wants to see you in the office. What am I going to do with the kids? You know, those type of things. Um, it, it's not just enough that maybe an adult is around to to look after them, but you're think, thinking of the quality time. Mm. Because if you're not stable, if you're not level-headed, the kids, you can easily transfer your aggression. On the kids. Um, yeah, on the kids. I actually remember one of the weekends when my kids came back from as young as the way when my kids came back from, from their, their mom's place. You know, my daughter was still very young and so she was just narrating the story and she was like, this is what mommy does when she's angry. And then she's like, so she took her dog and then slammed it into a chair. Oh I think goodness. what she's trying to indicate that in her frustration, because she didn't know how to handle them and the whole process, you know, she, she took out her frustration on them. And of course, you you hear that from a, from a child who is so young, yeah. you want to take that to court. That's just hearsay. It is mm. your word against there's this. You cannot prove that <laughs> it did not happen under my roof. So those are some things that you just mourn. Suddenly you start realizing that for real, you cannot control the other party. They are, you cannot control how to do things under their roof. Even if maybe if there are things that you covered for them or they covered for you while you guys are under the same roof, now it is separate. Right. And there's that limitation. There's no way you can tell the other party do this or do that. So for me, it was very... It was a very emotional process going through that. There was a day that they came back and my and my my son was telling me that someone in in the um in the mom's house hit him with a with a with a with a box and something. Oh so we're talking about very young kids. And so so you so just think about it for a moment. Who in their right mind will really will really do that? So you start and then I have no control over. Yeah. <laughs> you can only control your environment. You, where do you want to take that? Rush back to court, and they said you. They said you said they, they said so. You said no. They didn't say so. You said is it true? You said no. It's not the truth. And they're like, what are you guys doing here? Go and sort out your mess. The, the, the court system is not your dad or your mom or your god that you think that you just press some magic wand and then boom, the solution comes out the way you, the way you want it to be. So it was it was a very um, painful process, but I spent as much time as. I could with the kids you know I gave them as much hug as I could I repeatedly told them that I love them and Mm -hmm. and things like that and I had to keep it very I'm I'm just grateful because throughout that period it's after the divorce process that we we got to join custody but throughout that period the kids spent more time with me so at least I had a lot of I had a lot more control there you know during that period which one person might be like, oh, you're the man and whatever. I am a, I'm a dad to yeah. the core. So to me, it, it wasn't like overworking. I wanted to take care of my kids. So, yeah. 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 Wow. That's very commendable. You know, um, you know, in most cases, they're, especially with our African men who are not typically hands-on um, with children, most yeah. men will probably not know what to do with, you know, but I'm very glad that, you know, stories like yours show that men are African men are actually changing, especially with this generation. Cause our, yeah. our parents' generations, it's like the, the dads never really had any kind of intimate relationships with the children. It was just, yeah. like, they were just there to provide. And that was it, you know, but uh, despite every other thing that you were going through, you really took it upon yourself to make sure that the kids were protected and safe, which is very commendable. Now, I know, you know, historically, like I mentioned in the previous episode, the legal system actually has favored, uh, always favored women more than men. So what were actually your greatest struggles um, in this entire process of the divorce? Like, um, what would you say that uh, was the greatest challenge that you faced? Um, <laughs> it's, it's so easy, like so easy to spot that out without even just thinking. I was, <laughs> I was, I don't know if I was shocked, surprised, or it was a mix of everything. Or I just had to face the reality that at some point I found myself on the defensive side. Imagine you just, you just meet someone on the road and you tell them that, oh, you stole my car. 
oh, you stole my avocado, you stole my this. And then they spend their whole life that I didn't do it. They can't just walk away or run away because then it it might almost be proving their guilt. You know, if they react a certain way, it's like they're being defensive. If they sit quiet, it's like they're accepting, they're accepting it. That was kind of where I found myself. Because while the process was going on, it's interesting that they... The, both kids were in separate schools, one in a daycare, one in an elementary school at the, at the time. And um, the schools did not know each other, it, like the administration, the workers and things like that. But for the period of time that I took the kids there and I brought them home, you know, there, there were a lot of positive comments because there was a period of time that their, their mom could not even go to their school. So when she was given some time to start going there, the narrative changed both schools, both schools started giving the same complaints to me um, that it, it, it looks like as soon as their mom started showing up, the kids are regressing. That was especially for my for my daughter. Now that's not a positive thing. Yeah. It, it's almost like it's almost like I had worked with the school and the child had got to a certain level of maturity at their age, and then their mom comes and then things are going steps backwards. So okay, those are signs. It's interesting, the, one of the directors of one of the schools who was mentioning that to me, she also mentioned how they helped a dad who was giving one of, her, one of their workers a hard time. She mentioned how they, they worked together with the legal system to keep the dad out of the school completely. But you know, at the same time, that same director, she told me straight in my face, she was like, I know what's going on. There was very, there was a lot of stability before you came and we're noticing some instability and it's only when their mom is around. And she just told me straight, she says that but she's not going to, the court has sent these so-and-so papers to them to fill. She just told me straight that she's not going to write it. So right. it's so, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it was very, I, I experienced the same thing on both schools. So it's, it is almost like if, the domestic violence was not had not happened, and there was proof beyond you know. Be, <laughs> there was yes, and I, I'm sure they would have used that against me like mercilessly because all of that fight, all of that negativity, it's almost like unknown people just teamed up against the man. It is something yeah. they see a man, they see kids. And then suddenly they just feel like mom, yeah. <laughs> moms can do better than than that. Than that. It's just it, it is that, and to to a certain extent, I do not disagree. To a certain extent, there's a degree of truth in that. The way they fall short is that when they meet the dads who are really committed to their children, um, because there's a level dads who really do their jobs. There's a level of upbringing that the dads must be present. I know we grew up in a community, in a society in Africa where it's like oh, the upbringing of the child is the mom. I, yeah. ha- having spent some time here and with the other teachings that I've received, I'm a very, very, very firm believer that the children need a lot of that presence yeah. Yeah. in that house. The boy is growing up and he's likely to become like that. Yeah. The girl is growing up. This is not black and white. There are a lot of gray areas in this statement. The boy is growing up. He's likely to become like that. And the girl is growing up. She's likely to look for someone out there in the like future that. who looks like that. Yeah. So it is it is all of those things that were, were packaged. But I looked through the legal system, looked through the different um, places that were working. Um, I'm telling you the truth. If we had swapped places, the, their mom would have had full custody of the children. Yeah. So, yeah. but the kids were already with me 100%. It was, it was just... During the the uh, how do you call it during the um during the period of of separation of, of legal separation that yeah. I I had them and then because she had withheld the kids from me from three weeks when the kids came back to me they were not allowed to go back to her mm-hmm. until there was something was established from court yeah. and t- th- these are all things that were were that were supposed to work very negatively against her mm-hmm. I mean it's not like I. So, but somehow, <laughs> I cannot explain, somehow every little office, whether it's the case, um, the, um, it's not caseworker, they call them, or maybe it's caseworker, um, they, they're in the court system, the, the word yeah. just escaped my, my, my mind. Yeah. So, yes, the clerk, somehow, maybe? I don't know. Sorry? The clerk? No, it's not the clerk, it's, um, um, I can get their name later. Yeah, I don't know fine. what later means. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so, but somehow they took information from her, took information from me. By the time I was listening from listening to that same information in court being read aloud, I was 
<laughs> I, I was, I was, I was gobsmacked. I was, I was dumbfounded. I was speechless. How they took it. Literally, it's almost like they had decided the outcome ahead of time that there's no way we'll let this man have full custody of the kids. And so the, everything was twisted around. There was, wow. you know, there was a storyline <laughs> for the, let me just leave it there. They, they had, she and her Tony had built a very consistent storyline. From the time that I mentioned in the previous episodes, you know, how we met and the story was flipped around, you wouldn't believe it. Mm. The level, the extent to which people can get. So sometimes the divorce process itself is one thing, but sometimes the lies and yeah. the, 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 the way people go out of their way to destroy the other person, sometimes that is what hurts them even more. Um, even more. And you, 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 you realize that people will go to any extent if they're in a desperate place. Right. They might, we might say we are Christians or Buddhists or whatever, but, and we may be practicing that, but sometimes when we're pushed to our wit's end, the real us inside, if that inner part of us, our hearts have not been touched, the real part comes, you know, it comes out. Sometimes it can really be dark. I experienced all of that. It was painful to say the least. You know, you look at a paper, it's almost like someone is saying that I am, white and then you're spending your time to prove that you are not white (laughs) you're like isn't it obvious no they know how to twist it now how was life for you as a newly single man like um what challenges or freedoms um did you have as a single man i mean i know you've already touched a lot on you know um the experiences and the things that you know um, yes. struggles that you had and stuff like that. But now yes. that you were basically back on the streets, <laughs> I, I, I know, <laughs> right? <laughs> how is life for you as a single man? You know, sometimes it's, sometimes the greatest fight is with yourself and with your own thoughts, what you're really thinking about. So sometimes I have to think about what I'm thinking about and right. then you have to walk yourself um, um, through that. And sometimes you walk into a place, you are aware that no one is judging you, but you feel like they are looking at you. You know very well what the truth is. It's not, they don't even know your story and you have to adjust to that. So again, as back to life as a single man, when it came to my focus was getting healing. I do not want to use like a, a bounce back relationship. At that point, jumping quickly into another relationship, it's almost like some people say it, it works for them. Again, I'm just sharing my story. But just jumping, sometimes jumping quickly into another relationship without figuring yourself out, it's almost like um, like a drug, like medication. Yeah. Maybe so um, I have to be really um, careful with that because believe me, Things might be okay, but you just might not know how vulnerable you are inside. So those were just things that I was going through. Again, like I already mentioned, when it came to, you know, spending time with with the kid, it was not so much of a difficulty. My schedule had changed to a night night schedule, thankfully. I mean, we could could work things out somehow. When I say we, I mean in my household. Um, Yeah from the, the kids' bedtime routine, when they dress, and then when I get ready for work and things like that. So that was a transition, um, you know, in its on its own. I had some, I had a couple of ladies, you know, who just volunteered to help to do my daughter's hair, which was a good thing. Um, so, but the only thing, <laughs> I know this is not a direct answer to your question, but the only thing was that each time her hair was done, when when she, when they go over to their mom's place it, for, on a Friday, by the time they're returning on a Sunday, she has undone the the hair. Mm. So I, I I was thinking more about the child. But anyways, so yeah. my life more as a single person, you know, I had to think about you know my own singleness and mm. my own biological needs. And yeah. to be honest with you, suffering is part pain and suffering is part of the journey. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, sometimes if, if we don't handle the necessary suffering well, it leads to unnecessary suffering. I have to handle like emotional suffering. I have to I have to be careful about rela- relational blindness. But you know, just again, that goes back to just being aware of yeah. my own, my just knowing that I may have a lot of blind spots and I don't know where I'm very vulnerable. Yeah. I have to keep my circle of my accountability circle, my circle of friends, very minimal. Mm. Just so that, you know, I don't, um, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't 
find myself in a place which looks good for six months and then months and then later on you yeah, like it's the worst thing that ever happened to you. Right. So I had to just shift back as a Christian, uh, you know, who struggles with my own needs to daily. I have to just shift back to what the word of God um, actually, you actually say. I had to redefine what, what purity means for me. I wish I could say that this was perfect every day. Sometimes a whole year can be wonderful. Then the next year is a struggle. Yeah. You know, I had to think through what kind of temptations, you know, I was going through some of these things are not even just isolated in, you know, as a single person, sometimes even in, in marriage who face the same temptations, but giving into them. Yeah. So I, I really had to get some accountability partners. Like I remember a husband and a wife that uh, just, to, just so that, you know, I can hear myself what I'm saying mm. to make sure that, uh, yes, I'm actually, um, I'm actually healing in from the inside. It was just a lot of things, you know, that was, um, that was really going on because sometimes if you're not careful, you, you, if you are not watchful, it may not be your intent, but your emotions can drive you to want to show your ex spouse that you, you are now better at this or, or, yeah. or at that. It, it's just, it's just tricks. It, it's, it's like social media. That's all what it is. It's mind games, which is totally honest. It works in the short run. In the long run, it doesn't count anywhere. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. Now, I would imagine yeah. how much growth that you have had or you have made, how, how many strides you have overcome and how that has made you grow. So what has this entire ordeal or what has this entire experience taught you about yourself? Um, <laughs> a lot of things. And the one thing I learned about lessons is that learning your lesson is not enough. Having some measures in place, some guidelines, some boundaries can help you along the way because you can forget what you learn. And make uh, and make the same mistake in in one area or another. So I those are, those are one of the things that I had to really watch I had to really watch out for myself. Mm. So one of the things I learned about myself is that I am I am human. And the other thing I learned is that no matter how much you desire, maybe it's your children or whoever, you know, self control is the highest form of control. Yeah, much much better than other control. That's very true. Think, yeah, so so think about it. <laughs> you you could not live with a husband or a spouse. What makes you now that you guys both live in separate homes and in some situations there's underlying anger and bitterness? What makes you think that you can just and just tell them what to do? You have to find a way because some people their divorce is uncontested. They they've learned they are mature enough, you know, to understand that they have children in in their midst and, and, and that is their focus. They understand that the maturity, but sometimes, unfortunately, one party tries to use the children to control the other one. It just, it's sometimes just little things, yeah. not, <laughs> not big things here. And it is the children that suffer in those cases. In the long run, no one really, no one really, be, no one really benefits. So the other thing I learned about myself, I don't, that is not how God designed it to be. You know, like if we go back to Genesis, um, it says, for this reason, a man shall live. And cleave. So it is God originally intended family for man and woman to be in a home and take care of the children. Okay, but this is not how it worked out for me. I'm I'm saying so, but I'm <laughs> I'm a single man. You know, there are two kids and 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 and, and things like that. I I learned that we. It was hard for me as a man to reach out for help. Even now, it's still a little bit hard to to really reach out for help. So what I do uh, with my children is that I just try to allocate as much time as possible, you know, for you know to deal with them along 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 the journey. And what I learned in addition to self control is I know we just we talked about it briefly in the previous. Um, um, episode is about forgiveness that it is more about myself you know because sometimes we as christians when we hear forgiveness the next thing we think is reconciliation or just jump into the arms of the other person no my heart it was about my heart about the contents of my heart because sometimes things still happen your ex-spouse might do something to really get you upset now those uh, you can shoot, make you have the choice to focus on her. Say, oh, this woman, or that, or whatever she did, or it, and that's a moment for you too. Your response is your responsibility. So those are things that I had to learn um, about myself, which helped me to see how much healing 
has happened, you know, in the inside of me. And one of the lastly, even though it's not one, the last thing, but for the purpose of this um, conversation, lastly, I I learned that you know we we need to. It is good to be in a healthy relationship, mm. but to be alone is different from being lonely. We lonely, we, yeah. we, we need to, yes we need to be an asset, you know, mm. <laughs> to another person. We should be bringing something. Yeah. We we are not going into a relationship because that is what makes us. I don't know how you say it. That's not because that's what will make us. us. Y- Yes, yes. So we have to find a place where we are not desperate, where we are comfortable enough to be by ourselves. You know, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's like someone said to someone said to his wife, what can I do without you? And the woman was like many things. <laughs> and right. of course, the, the man was upset, but the woman was the woman was right. Was right. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, you can't love someone if you don't love yourself. Yeah. Bottom line. You know, um, so we have to actually learn to be in a relationship with ourselves before even trying to be in a relationship with someone else. Because it's very easy for you to lose yourself, you know, in the midst of all that chaos. If you really don't have a strong foundation, if you don't build a strong foundation with yourself. Um, And I mean, I'm, I'm not talking as an expert and I'm not talking as someone who's better off. Like we're all human. And we learn yes. with the situations, but um, we learn with experiences as well. But one thing I've learned for sure, and I'm still learning, is that, you know, I can't give what I don't have. And I yes. can't give love if I don't have love for my own self. I can't depend on someone to love me or to make me somebody that I can make myself to be, you know. Yes. So um, that's very important. Now, if you had to visit this situation Again, what will you do differently, or what will you not do at all? <laughs> oh my goodness, Th- that is what you just said for me is my definition of life. You know, things go around. You don't have to ask the wind to blow north or west. It is just a matter of time. Right. If it doesn't, after it blows today, it might be eight mile wind today. Maybe tomorrow is one mile. It is just a matter of time. It's going to blow again. Such is life. Because things will come along your way that will test your resolve, will test your boundaries and, and, and things like that. I think um, I think it was a very expensive, ignorance is costly. You might say, oh, I do not know, and I, this and that, that is why I did this. But it does not take away the consequences of those decisions. Right. So I faced a lot of consequences as a result of the decisions that I made the choice of a spouse, the route to divorce and then back to a single person, you know, and then back to a single person again. Mm -hmm. And just looking back on hindsight, what I would have done differently. I think when this one, I'm not just talking about home. I'm just, I'm talking about community where I grew up, you know, it was almost like the, the, the voice of the, the voice of the elders is what counts. I, that's yeah. how I can put it. I, but but, but I, I remember, if I may permit me to go back to my own Christian roots, I remember there's a story of um, um, Samuel and, um, and the priest in, mm-hmm. in, in, um, in, 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 in the Bible. God was talking to the young man, and the, the old man just helped him, the young man, to interpret it. But God did not go and talk to the, to the old man. I, my, what is my point? My point is that sometimes it is good to trust our our, our instincts, our gods. It, it, sometimes it is better that you make certain decisions and then you take full responsibility for your actions, the good, the bad, or the ugly. Yeah. It does not make sense. It's not mature enough for a person to be saying that, oh, it was this man who said I should marry him or her, or it was this woman who said I should mm. marry him or her. They are not going to live with you. So on hindsight, I think, because like I said, there was a point where I was like, this is, I'm done. That was actually six months before we even got married. Mm-hmm. So, but you know, but I, I, I over time, I, I listened to, I, I, I let go of what I was really feeling. Um, I, because sometimes you know what you know, but yeah. you don't have the language to put it in a way that is persuasive or convincing, not that you're trying to persuade or convince someone. So uh, for me, I call that maturity. The price was very great, you know, you know, to get to that point. I went back to my emails 10 years back and I was just looking at my conversations with my very close people and I was seeing where I was, 
I was trying to just gauge my level of maturity. I was trying to gauge how much, uh, you know, like they say that if you make people a God, then be prepared to worship them. Mm-hmm. So I was just trying to see how much I have let, vo- voluntarily let other people to run my life and how I trusted their own mistakes wow. more than my own errors. Wow. And, 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 I know, and I was just thinking, wait, how can I, this is just like an, like an analogy, an analogy. How can I run to, I'm not a millionaire, he is not a millionaire. How can I run to someone who is not a millionaire to tell me how to be a millionaire when he is not? And then for some reason, I'm trusting his advice more than the journey that I can go through myself. So I had to take responsibility for those little um, slothful um, mental laziness I'm um, here and there about myself. So those are things that I've learned along the way and and I've been presented over time with one or two opportunities again to see how much I'd learned the lesson. And what I had learned is that I cared so much about what people will say. <laughs> people will say anyways, right. whether you are a, 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 a people pleaser or not, people will say they have the right to what they say, whether you like it or not. So I you know, have grown in that aspect too, to be comfortable with that. I still have friends so that we are friends, but for some reason, we don't talk about relationships anymore because they vehemently, I mean, they are vehemently opposed to my decision. These are people who actually have, fe- have first-hand knowledge mm. of the whole situation, but they ve- vehemently opposed to it. So, and I get it. So where we can relate, we still relate, you, you know? And so it is, it is, it is really that it is right. really that. Yeah, but there's a lot. Right. Well, thank you very much for sharing. I mean, one thing that I've gotten from you and from this discussion is the importance of discernment. I believe I had mentioned that in the previous episode. I mean, as a Christian, one thing I pray almost on a daily basis is for God to give me the spirit of discernment. Because, I mean, discernment can come through intuition or instincts or the gods, like you could call it. Um, Because discernment, when you strongly feel something about something, chances that that thing is what you're feeling is very high the chances are very high yes. but then you know especially when we're all trapped in in our emotions our emotions are so powerful that they blind us and mm-hmm. they always get us to misjudge situations and circumstances so yeah always praying for a very very strong spirit of discernment it's what i do every day because sometimes i can make irrational decisions just at the moment and those are all emotional decisions that blindsides me from actually um acting based on my instincts or my all the, the discernment that i feel you know yes. um i mean this has been such a very touching an eye-opening conversation with you. And um, I really hope that the listeners are as touched as I am. I mean, I probably am feeling it even way more because I've known you for this long. And to hear (laughs) these stories is just like mind-blowing and at the same time, very, very sad. Um, And I, again, I'm so sorry to hear about everything that you went through. But on the other hand, I'm actually very excited that you started a conversation now, the purpose yeah. of this podcast is to spark those uncomfortable conversations among circles. And I'm very, very sure and convinced that a lot of men who listen to this podcast will probably go back to themselves first and examine their lives and, you know, know that they're not alone and probably yeah. do the right thing, which will protect them and protect yeah. their offspring. And also, I hope that this podcast also sparks a lot of conversation within several circles for us, especially as Africans, to realize or appreciate the fact that men also go through stuff, just that they don't talk about it. And I yeah. really want to encourage every single man out there to step up. This is a platform not only for women, but also for men, for blue, yellow, purple, all things African. Basically. Yeah. So if you really want to talk about your story, step up and, you know, reach out to me. My contact information is always in the bio. Um, Reach out to me and we can set up something. But your last word for especially for men, because this episode, I really want to direct this episode as men. So what is the last word that you can have for men to encourage them to step up and speak up? Um, That is a very... um... (laughs) So, like, my last word, I would just preface it by saying that, like, even when I kept going from one place to the other to seek help, most of the of the meetings organized by the county that I encountered, believe me or not, there were a lot of meetings that I ran into, and I was the only man there. 
and they had to struggle to adjust it because it is almost like they were not expecting a man. Right. So I would just speak, I would, I'm saying that to just piggyback on, piggyback on something you mentioned. It is one voice at a time. It, yes. it may take a day, it may take a century, but it's just building on that for our voices to be heard appropriately. You know, I, I know the buildup of men, it's like if we start speaking this way or that way, then it's almost like we are crybabies. No, on the contrary, it's really just speaking up you know, and t- responsibly and accountably, you know, where we need to, instead of just, uh, you know, instead of just being silent and because, uh, and instead of just being silent and then stocking things in and then letting it just explode in, yeah. in, in, in different, different um, in ways. different ways. So, and, um, you know, because what is going on is that we have the younger generation to coming up. They are looking up to us. Yeah. And um, if we can pave the way, you know, for how, for better responsibility, for better leadership, not control, good leadership, then, you know, it begins to be like an eye-opener um, positively. If yeah. we hear of statistics in the United States about single parenting homes, for the most part, it's the mother. Women, it's not yes. it's, it's not the man. So that's a narrative that we have to start changing. And lastly, I just want to say that men, we are fully Respond, bringing up our children is not and um, it's not a responsibility that is, has been abandoned mm. or to to a mother and then we are just coming in to help no we yeah. are there fully you know that it's not like well. it's a mother's yeah. it we all have to be fully present mm. hands-on as much as we can be you know depending on our different roles whatever we do as a job you know each home knows how to make the adjustments appropriately right. and for the men who are either separated or, or divorced do your best to work on yourself and trying to take your anger out on maybe your ex your ex-spouse or your soon-to-be ex-spouse you know because right. at the end of the day it is yourself. If anger leads you on the wrong road, then she, she gets more, more, more benefit over you. But it's really just trying to look at the bigger picture ahead, which is not easy to do. Mm. Because even if you are right, does not necessarily mean that your life after divorce will be better than the party who did whatever. So it's not about competition. It is about um, appropriate responsibility, about our own value systems and personal responsibility. Right. Wow, that was a powerful end to a very, very powerful series. Um, and thank you so much, Femi, for sharing your story. I, I probably have thanked you. I don't know if I had a dollar every time I thanked you. I probably will be a millionaire by now. But I know, right? I, you know, this is I, I, I'm super, super excited for people to hear this. And um, I am so appreciative. And probably on behalf of the whole African community, we appreciate you stepping up. And Thank I you really so much. hope you're welcome. I hope many more men can step up. I really look forward to talking to more men. I've always been engaged with a lot of women in past episodes. So I really tend to get very excited when men step up and they're like, yeah, I want to tell my story. And um, I just hope that this conversation does not only end here. And like I mentioned, like I hope yeah. that the conversation continues among circles. Um, the conversation opens up our mind, opens up our perspective to see things from the other side and yeah. to know that um, both sexes equally go through stuff. I mean, one might be prevalent than the other. And when I mean one, like with respect to women, women may experience this more than men, but it does not defy the fact that men do not experience it as well. Men actually do experience it. And when you yeah. hear stories like this, um, stories that are really, really horrific, you know, that men go through, but they just don't want to talk about it. Now, um, I guess I'll see you guys on the next episode, but thank you so much for listening and let me know what you think in the comments. Thank you. That's it for today. Thank you for listening to our show. If you want to participate in the show or find out more helpful resources, then visit www.livingafricanpodcast.com for more information or email us at hello at livingafricanpodcast.com. Also, don't forget to connect with us on all social media platforms at Living African Podcast. You can also connect with Anyo directly on Facebook or Instagram at Anyo. Fombard. Thanks again for listening and let's not forget to be more understanding and nicer to one another.